The viewpoints expressed on Night Fright are not necessarily those of the host, the staff, the sponsors, or the affiliate stations. Tonight's program may contain graphic themes or images. Viewer discretion is advised. There is a time for question. There is a time for answers. There is a time for challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Showtime! Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland, and welcome, one and all, to Night Fright. Tonight, the Dietlov mystery. Okay, folks, as I look outside the window tonight, the studio, it is a snowstorm out there. It's coming down like crazy. It's freezing. The temperatures plummeted right through the earth, I think, tonight. Now, if one went outside tonight the conditions the way they are tonight without proper shelter and clothing well let's just say the elements are going to win very very quickly it's the perfect night folks to settle in your most comfy chair huddle by the fire get the comforter up get the coffee going get the tea going or a beverage of choice it's also the perfect storm for our story tonight the diet love pass incident okay it's winter january 1959 minus 30 degrees celsius now folks when it gets that cold celsius fahrenheit it's brass monkey weather let's be honest <laughs> okay it's minus 22 fahrenheit <laughs> just to translate for those of our fans that are south of the border the ural mountains deep in the heart of mother russia which was then of course 1959 the soviet union it's the height of the Cold War, let's not forget that. And the threat of nuclear holocaust is ever-present on the world's minds. There's a blizzard roaring on Mount Kolat Siakal. God, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Now, an aside about this particular mountain. There's a local legend from the local indigenous people. They're called the Mansi, which has been handed down as a warning from generation to generation. It is perhaps chilling that the name Mount Colat Siakal translates to English as, are you ready for this? The Mountain of the Dead. Yeah, that's where we're going to go tonight. As the legend goes, during a hunting excursion, nine Mansi hunters decided it was in their best interest to make camp and stay overnight on this location due to a blizzard that came out of nowhere, a situation that remains to today. Now, the following day, all nine were found dead. None showed any signs of trauma. Their deaths unexplained. Consequently, the mountain became regarded as cursed, and the Mansi completely avoided it. Now, back to 1959, ten hikers make their way onto Mount Colslat, Seattle, on what was supposed to be a fun-filled trip. One day into the excursion, one of the members took ill and decided to go home. His luck. The remaining nine continued on their journey. Now, this is January 1959. Up to January 28th, everything can be independently verified about the group's journey. Beyond that date, and despite the presence of a group diary and photographs, nothing can be verified. When the search parties found their tent, they saw that the side of the tent had been slashed and footprints led away deep in the snow. All of their belongings had been left, indicating a hasty escape from the tent. Now, why? 
there's more. The first bodies were found to have died of hypothermia. Now, you're going to expect that in minus 30 temperatures. You've only got a little while. The remaining bodies, however, were found weeks later and were found to have no external marks but internal injuries. As a matter of fact, folks, one of the two females in the group was found to have her tongue missing. And another anomaly, radiation was detected on clothes. There appeared to be no rational explanation for the circumstances of their death, and the final report, investigative report, ultimately blamed the deaths on, and I quote, an unknown compelling force which the hikers were unable to overcome. Okay, fast forward 57 years, again to January, just last year, 2016, year ago, and the body of a lone 50-year-old man is discovered by another group of tourists. This time it was called in via satellite phone. Now why leave a body all alone? The same spot. Tonight our guest Keith McCloskey has written two books on the mystery surrounding this, and he will reveal what his research has found. His books are Mountain of the Dead, The Diatov Love, Pass Incident, Journey to the Diatov Love Pass, an Explanation of the Mystery. Keith McCloskey is our guest tonight, all the way from the UK tonight, where it's in the middle of the night, and he's a super trooper for staying up so late. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. I hope the weather is better here than there. I mean, better there than here. <laughs> Maybe I was right the first time. <laughs> Uh, thanks for having me on, Brent. Um, yeah, the weather here is quite pleasant, actually. It's nothing like there, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> well, you're uh, welcome it, any time. Yeah, and it's the middle of the night, you're right. But uh, uh, I'm happy to be on the show. Um, yeah, so where would you like me to start? Well, uh, what do you think of the Trump election? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to yeah. virtually break the ice. <laughs> this this is a horror show, show, you said. <laughs> It is night fright after all, folks, <laughs> and God knows if we're going to be around after the 21st, but we shall see together, and we shall see well together. Okay, my friend, how did you get involved in this incident? I mean, this isn't something that you're close to geography, uh, in terms of geography or anything else. No, no, it's, um, I came onto it, but in a roundabout way, um, I've always been interested in uh, Soviet military history particularly aviation, and uh, it was when I was researching um, for a a project I was doing that somebody mentioned the theory, one of the theories about the the deaths could have been caused by uh, a a Soviet bomber, uh, or bombers, there was two of them, and that's how I came onto it, because I'd never heard of it before, and uh, the more I looked into it... um, you know the thing that really got me, I think, was the the, str- the 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 actual deaths themselves. If they'd all left the tent and they'd all died of the cold, you'd be thinking, well, okay, maybe it was, they thought there was going to be an avalanche or whatever reason. You can understand people running away from something like that and then dying of the cold. But the whole thing, the the, the weirdest thing about it all is half of them died of the cold. Half of them died of horrific internal injuries. Uh, and I think that's what draws everybody to it, you know, because the injuries, you, you just almost can't explain them. You know, the, the whatever theory you come up with, uh, whether anybody comes up with, never answers all the questions. Um, when I first started looking at it, um, I... I I had to go along. There was a, a, a Russian journalist had uh, put forward a proposal. He was the uh, the first man to really start tearing the official case apart. Um, and I uh, I don't agree with everything he said, but he was the first. He said uh, that the deaths had occurred somewhere else, and that the bodies had been brought there. Um, you know, and, uh, he he called it. Uh, a scene-setting exercise was how he described it. And I must admit, I went along with that because if there'd been a, a blast of some kind and they all died, you'd expect to see, you know, say it happened down in the trees 
you'd expect to see dead birds, dead animals possibly, and you know trees torn out of the ground or whatever. Um, and his proposal, if you like, or his theory was that they died somewhere else. The authorities brought them all to the mountain, uh, reassembled the tent, hence all the queries about the flashlight, you know, the uh, the damaged ski pole that nobody could recognize, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Can you they, tell us about that? Because I'm unaware of those two, the flashlight well, and the pole. Yeah, the, well, what, what a, a couple of the anomalies after they found the tent was um, uh, there was a damaged ski pole and nobody could recognize it. Uh, you know, Yuri Yudin uh, was involved. Uh, he was asked to uh, identify, you know, the stuff that they brought back because they didn't know who belonged, what belonged to who of the people that had died. And the intention was, once the investigation was over, to give it, obviously, back to the families. Uh, but there, nobody could identify this damaged ski ski pole. And Yuri Yudin said uh, that none, no, but none of them had been carrying a, a, a ski pole when he looked at it like that. And the fact that it was damaged as well was also rather strange. Can you uh, tell the folks who Yuri Yudin is? Oh, sorry. Um, well, Yuri Yudin was the guy who turned around. Uh, he, he was suffering pains and uh, in his back and his leg. Uh, basically, he'd, he'd had an injury before and uh, he used to play up in the cold. But he made it to the abandoned geologist village, second last stop. And he that, that day, the 28th of January, he searched around for some minerals that he'd promised to take back to the university for somebody. And then he said to the others, basically, I've had enough. Uh, I'm returning. So he set off uh, back to go back to the city, to Sverdlovsk, where they'd all set out from. That saved his life, that decision, because he'd have died with the rest of them. The other anomaly of the tent when it was found was a Chinese-made flashlight on top of the tent, which was still working. The switch was in the off position, but the tent had collapsed under the weight of snow. The bodies weren't found for almost four weeks. The tent was exposed to the elements. It snowed. The tent collapsed. There was snow on top of the tent, but this flashlight had nothing on top of it. So you would expect if they dropped a flashlight on the tent when they were leaving it or escaping from it, it too would have been covered in snow. But it wasn't. It was on top of the snow. And that's been picked up as an anomaly by this journalist, he said, well, how has that happened? Um, to him, it's like snow was shoveled onto the tent and somebody chucked the flashlight down on top of it to make it look good. And tied in with that was a searcher in a light aircraft was flying over the area the day before the tent was found. And he said he had seen two bodies lying by the tent, which would imply a seam of some kind was being set. And he died in a plane crash a few years later. And there's a story involved in that as well. He was quite fearful of the whole thing. His name was Gennady Petrushov. He had known Igor Dyatlov as well. There is a, a story that he met them in Ivdel on their way up, and he warned them to be careful because the mountains there are pretty inhospitable. I want to go back to January 1959. Now, as I mentioned before, it's the height of the Cold War. Now, doing the research, I found that all the students were from the same place, the Gural Polytechnic Institute. And this institute, folks, um, they were doing some interesting stuff. They were working on metallurgy, machine building, civil engineering, and engineerics. At the same time, they were working on knowledge of nuclear energetics, organic chemistry and synthesis, and tele communications. This was ominous to me, and then I read later that Alexander Kolebatov had worked with nuclear materials in the past, and he'd left that work, and George Krivonshenko worked on a top-secret plant where plutonium was made for nuclear weapons, and as I said at the outset, they found traces of radiation on some of the clothes. Is there a connection there, do you feel? What, what struck me as odd about the whole radiation business is that after the first um, five bodies were found, there was no mention of radiation. 
It was only when the last four bodies were found in May, in early May, that uh, an instruction came from higher authority for part of the area and the clothes and the bodies to be tested for radiation, which is a peculiar thing to happen. When, when you read um, about Lev Ivanov, who was the guy who was, if you like, doing the legwork, you know, the detective on the case, uh, he gives the impression he was the one who instigated it, but the actual order came from Moscow for them to be tested for radiation. So you would expect at that point the first five bodies had had their autopsies and they'd been buried. You would have expected that they would have been exhumed, but they weren't. So only the final four bodies were tested for radiation. And people play down the radiation aspect of it because uh, it was beta radiation, and which obviously is harmful to humans in you know, higher doses, and they say, well, the, the radiation wasn't that bad, but they, they avoid stating that they've been lying in water, which washes the radiation away uh, for some time before the bodies were found, and even with that, there were still high levels of radiation. So, really, the, there was very, the, there was a high concentration of radiation there, and it must have been very localized, which is the other odd thing about it, because you would expect if there was some kind of radiation leak from somewhere, you'd think, well, they'd be, you know, the whole place would be closed down and they'd be, te you know, like Chernobyl or something like that. You'd be expecting them to test all over. But whatever it is, it seems to have been very, very localized in a small area, which is very, very peculiar. Any chance there was nuclear waste in the area and perhaps this was a dumping zone for it? Um, well, anything to do with nuclear matters in the Soviet Union at that time was top secret. I quote in my book from Lev Ivanov's boss, and he mentions that he met somebody who dealt with nuclear matters not long after this happened. The implication was they'd moved the testing ground from the further south up to the northern Urals, but the guy wouldn't say any more about it. There'd been a moratorium. Uh, uh, by Khrushchev, uh, you know, the, by the Soviets, it had been agreed there would be no more nuclear testing. So it's possible that maybe they were continuing to test secretly. They'd moved the, the place, if you like, where the testing was happening down much further south and moved it up much further north out of prying eyes, if you like. I was curious about that aspect because, you know, there was the nuclear test ban treaty above ground, but not below ground. Yeah, yeah, but the, 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 but the thing, the Maybe thing I'm about... too much into this. No, I don't think you are at all. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very, very pertinent thing because um, it, it, it's, it wasn't all over the place. It was very, very, it seems to have been very localized, almost as if I don't know, for argument's sake, uh, some kind of weapon had been focused on a small area where they were. That's what comes, comes out of it to me. 75 miles, maybe a bit more than that, south of the Diatlov Pass, and it was present then, they were just starting to use it, is the, a nuclear warhead storage area at a place called Lesnoy. Could there have been a leak from there? But you see, if there'd been a leak from there, the whole area would be closed. That's what's strange about it. There's plenty of nuclear facilities there further south from that, and you pass it. You Literally, the train goes through it. There's an area that's closed off to everybody, foreigners included, um, and it's a plutonium pro processing plant. That was in operation when they were up there. But that's, much for that. that's not far out of uh, Sverdlovsk or Ekaterinburg, as it is now. So th there's a lot of nuclear stuff going on in that area. But, like I say, uh, it's just odd that it only seems to have been a small event involved radiation. Again, it's another mystery, if you like, of this story, because there's no proper explanation for it. Let's talk some more about some of the other theories. Now, on February 2nd, another group of hikers who are 50 kilometers away from the incident reported that they had seen strange orange spheres in the night sky to the north in the direction of the pass where the hikers were camping. Now, whenever I hear orange something in the sky, I think, well, it's got to be a meteor or something of that magnitude. 
And of course, if a meteor struck the ground, then we would know about it. There would be something, something. Something chased these poor kids, I'm going to call them kids, out of their tent. Um, I should also mention that the bodies, some of the bodies were found, folks, with no boots. Uh, they were just in their underwear, minus 30 in their underwear, uh, minus 22 Fahrenheit. Something must have terrified the bejesus out of them to slash their tent and bolt out of the tent and try and make it down this mountain pass to get away from something. And now we're, we're just trying to speculate what this something could be. Now, there was another theory I was reading about that perhaps it had something to do with a portable wooden stove they had brought along with them, that perhaps that had caused some sort of melting or some sort of fire, and there was smoke inside the tent, but the tent was not burnt. So to me, that eliminates that one. What's your opinion of that one? Well, the, the the stove, when when they found the tent, was in the stored position. They had their fill of food and closed it down, if you like, for the night. Whatever happened, happened not long after that. But uh, but the lights in the sky, for me, are the, are the, the, the crux of the whole mystery, because... Uh, you know, they've been seen by other people. People have ex tried to explain the lights as if, well, this is natural phenomena. But there's several witnesses who live up there who mention the lights. They're, 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 you know, they live there all the time, so they know what's a natural phenomena and what isn't. Um, and it was mentioned, it was, seen, it was seen by people in Ivdel, which is 80 miles away, um, and, you know, these other students who were on the Chistop Massive, um, they, they'd seen it as well. And I want to mention that in a minute uh, in relation to radiation. But uh, it, it, many people had seen the light. So there's obviously something going on in the night sky. Um, in my book, uh, I've detailed the work of uh, Valentin Yakimenko. He, he knew the group members and he took over as chairman of the uh, ski tourist club the following year after the deaths um he was also the first person up on the pass when they were, started giving permits out and he raised uh, uh, the memorial to them and he so he, he's been very much involved in the case for you know well ever since it happened um but uh he he um he he examined the negatives that were found and came up with some very interesting stuff. There was obviously something going on in the night sky. And the trouble is, uh, you can't really make it. There's two of the negatives look like a plane breaking up and coming down to Earth. Another one of the negatives looks like an explosion. Another one, he gives each of them names as to what they resemble, but some of them, you, know, you, you just can't make head nor tail of them. And he took a, a, people say, well, these were just marks on the negatives, but the point is some of the negatives from different cameras are showing the same thing, the same objects in the sky, the, the lights. So you can't say, well, it's, it'd be highly unusual for the same defect or the same mark to be in two or three different cameras so whatever's going on is has been recorded on more than one camera uh, and the other thing about it is whatever happened with the lights happened in a period of one and a half to two minutes that's the length of time he estimated that they took the pictures and Zolotarev had, had taken uh, a picture um, of the whole event but some of his Slide, uh, some of his negatives were missing, so which adds further speculation because did somebody remove them? Did they get lost? If they did remove them, why did they remove them? So you're back into speculation again. But you know what's fascinating to me is whenever I hear orange, of course, um, I was wondering if it could be an explosion, of course, in the sky or even uh, an afterburner thrust from an airplane. Um, is there any evidence uh, that they had with them a Geiger counter? And perhaps that's what triggered them to, to flee. We always hear about the nuclear bomb just off of B.C. that went down with an airplane, and they still have yet to find it. And I'm just wondering if, it may have, if the casing may have been breached, if something like that happened, if it was just um, 
a nuclear accident. Uh, what do they call it in in, uh, in America? They have a name for it, actually. Something yeah. about a, a broken uh, arrow. Is yeah, it? broken arrow. Yeah. 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 Something yeah, but uh, the, the the thing is, though, if, if you're talking about these large yield weapons, uh, I mean, the the, the Soviets uh, exploded the largest nuclear bomb. What was it 50 megatons uh, north of there? But uh, you know, if it was a giant nuclear explosion, everybody would have known about it. But it's possible maybe it was something with a much lower yield, a training exercise. But the the, the part of the problem for me though is. Whatever theory you're coming up with, it just does it does not explain everything. For me, it's something to do with the lights. There's radiation involved, but you know, even when you work on the military, and I've studied the Soviet military for many years, the aviation in particular. There was an air base to the west of where they were, about 80 miles away. Um, would it have been something connected with that? It, it's, it's possible, but it still doesn't explain all the injuries and how they died. You see, if there was an explosion, you would expect limbs to be torn off, you know, and why did four of them just die of the cold? It, 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 it's this business of the two separate lots of deaths that throws every theory into, you know, you, you say, well, that explains so far, but it doesn't explain everything. Um, in my first book, you may have read about uh, Yuri Yakimov, who worked at a, a, a mine up there, and his experience with lights on the ground. He'd been working on his own in a mine and seen a set of lights in the trees. When he looked at them, they started coming towards him. I interviewed him on my last trip there. I said, well, well what do they look like? And he said, it's like a row of lights. He said it was like three or four and as they approached him, they were separating out. It was like somebody had three torches and they were coming towards him because they were moving as if somebody was running with torches. But the lights were expanding. Three was becoming five, was becoming seven. And he looked away and he hid. He said the overwhelming feeling that he had was one of fear. And he said that the lights stayed there. He could see the, the lights from where he was hiding. And apparently they were very powerful he said they made the mine look like daylight. And he said the shadows were sh so sharp, it was like you could cut it with a knife. The shadow thrown by the tree was really sharply delineated because of the strength of the lights. And then he mentions um, a forest ranger who had the same experience not long after he did. Um, and, you know, a forest ranger, you could say, well, these are guys who probably been on the vodka too much or something like that, <laughs> possibly. But uh, uh, I, uh, Yuri Akimov struck me as a very, very down-to-earth guy. Um, and uh, the forest ranger he interviewed was a, an older man, spent all his life working in the forests on his own with a rifle for protection, uh, dealing with bears and wolves and all, and, and, not, and a guy not easily scared, if you like, um, but he was frightened by what he saw of these lights. He hid down behind a trunk and waited for them to go, and it took a couple of hours before they went. So, But he didn't want to show himself, and that's with a rifle. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first-person witness accounts. Order yours right now, nightfrightshow.com. Folks, I just want to tell you we're speaking with Keith McCloskey tonight, all the way from the UK. He's being a super trooper. He's up late. And uh, he's just uh, about 100 kilometers. Is that what you said? 100 miles? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's about 50. 50. 50, okay. And uh, his books, he's got two great books, Mountain of the Dead, The Dietov Love Pass Incident, Journey to Dietov Lost Pass, an explanation of the mystery, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest book covers. We'll take you right to a place where you can order them from the comfort of your home. And tonight's a good night to do that. Stay inside with the snow raging outside. Okay, you had touched on a couple of things, the mining. And uh, you had also touched on the alcohol. Now, we know that several of the students were found with alcohol. That's no big deal. I mean, if you're going to go on a camping trip and you're a student, guess what, folks? <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's, especially in that kind of weather, pretty sure there's going to be alcohol involved. Without question. One of the other ones was a little bit more um, 
you know, the mining one, people say that there was prospectors up there mining for gold by themselves. And the Soviet Union would not allow that, folks. Everything is for the common good in the Soviet Union. You're not allowed. It's like stealing from the government, if you will. If you find nuggets of gold, they have to be turned over to the government. So there was a theory that perhaps there was some miners in the area. The students saw them mining, and to silence them, they attacked them. I don't know how you feel about that one. And then I want to get into Yeti. The thing about uh, illegal mining was that you would get the death penalty for it. So you can understand uh, a bunch of guys who have been observed illegal mining. They, they wouldn't take too kindly to being observed, so they would do what they had to do to silence whoever had seen them. But I don't know. It, you, were de- you had nine young people, all very fit. Okay, they didn't have any weapons. Where they had uh, axes, if you like, and knives. But Zolotarev, for instance, he was much older than the rest of them. Uh, it was The night they died was his 38th birthday. But he had fought at Stalingrad, and he had medals for um, close combat fighting so he he wasn't uh he wasn't any kind of a, a weakling or you know he'd be a guy who could take care of himself and um, and the rest of them were all very fit uh, so i'm sure they you know if their lives had been threatened they would have put up a fight of some kind especially if they knew they were going to die for certain um but I, i'm not it's it's a possibility like everything else but but it, it's the footprints though you, you would have to see more footprints the, what the uh, search parties were saying, that they found eight to nine pairs of footprints. Okay, maybe they were chased out, or who knows, maybe that scene was set by illegal miners, you don't know. I wouldn't rate it too highly, but tied in with that, of course, is the Mansi, the people that live there. The, there is talk that the mountain was sacred to them. The interview in my book with Okishov, he interviewed one of the elder Mansi in Hivdel. He went up there, and he said after talking to him, he was absolutely convinced the Mansi had nothing to do with it. What this guy said to him was that people, Russians especially, because obviously they viewed them as a different ethnic group, but any Russian coming up there would be treated as an honoured guest, and they had no reason to kill anybody for going on that mountain because it meant nothing to them anyway, literally nothing to them, which is why they gave it its name, of Mountain of the Dead, because of the deaths there. Dead Mountain is the literal translation in Mansi, and just for what it's worth, it's now called by many Russians Mountain of the Nine for the people that died there. In the time that the Diatlov party was going up there, it was simply called Elevation 1079 to them. They didn't call it by its name because that was more of a Mansi thing. It's an interesting point, by the way, just very quickly. The elder that came down to see Okishov uh, in Ivdel, Okishov had booked uh, a room in a hotel for him, but he said he couldn't sleep indoors, and he insisted on sleeping out, out in the snow with his dogs in the town. He said he just couldn't sleep indoors at all. <laughs> so quite hardy people. No kidding. <laughs> Sounds like Canadians. <laughs> just kidding, <Yeah>. folks. <laughs> Keith, uh, can we rule out paranormal? Can we rule out well, a, a yeti? No. Can, no, okay, please. Or, or UFOs. No, no. I'll, I'll tell you a story. I had Jane Goodall on yeah. the show. And Jane Goodall told me, in all sincerity, she believes in Bigfoot. And the reasons she gave were quite sound. She said everywhere she goes around the world, Aboriginal people come up to her and tell her the same story. They always spot this type of creature that's neither a man, neither an ape, or neither a monkey. And uh, it's basically the same description. So I'm just wondering, is there a creature called Yeti? Could they, could perhaps they have entrenched on the Yeti's territory or something along those lines? Can we go down that road? And see it, 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 it certainly, uh, I certainly would not uh, dismiss paranormal theories out of hand. Many people do. But um, I'm more and more coming round to the idea that no theory seems to explain what happened up there. So you've got to start looking at other things. Just because nobody say seen a Yeti doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The lights, you know, people go on about UFOs, which they are. If, if there are lights in the sky and it's not a plane you know of, it's an unidentified flying object. And Levy Vanoff actually wrote a, a long article, which I've reproduced in my book, as to his opinion, was that it was 
UFOs of some type. He he he, he said uh, that it they weren't military, that there was something going on in the night sky, and, and I'm firmly convinced of that as well. But nobody can explain what it was. Um, if, if if they were lights or you know or some kind of craft, the, the, the thing is, it's probably technology based, but nobody knows what it is. But until some more evidence comes to light. You you can't discount it, I don't think. They, they say about the Yeti um, or a similar type animal, uh, yeah, Siberia is a massive place, gigantic area, uh, and you can go for hundreds of miles and see nobody. Um, so that, who's to say that there aren't creatures up there that nobody's seen before? It, it's, it's, it's definitely a possibility. The, you know, um, I know where they were was pretty remote and uninhabited um you know cre- uh, one thing i was told about bears for instance they try to avoid uh, i mean uh, that was my biggest fear going up there because we were up there in the summer and there was two there was one giant bear in the vic- immediate vicinity of where we were but you know, we didn't see them you know, the, one of the bears, apparently, somebody had, had estimated it was over six foot of the shoulder, an absolute giant. But we didn't hear it, we didn't see it, and uh, we think there was another one nearby as well. So you had two large, wild, powerful animals almost within a couple of hundred meters of it, and we didn't even see it. So who's to say that there isn't? You know, I put myself in their in their place. I've been camping. Everybody, I think, has been camping in a tent in a remote area mm-hmm. um, outside of a campground or anything like that. And I tell you, you know, when you hear a sound outside, a uh, breaking of a stick or something moving in the woods that you can't identify and you're just using your ears, you're enclosed in this tent, you're isolated. And I remember one specifically, we heard this thing buzzing around just outside the tent. We thought it was a bear, but we got our flashlights, big, brave Canadians, and we looked outside. It was a little raccoon. (laughs) 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 Just, you know, rummaging through things and just checking us out and making sure we were copacetic and and all that. So all I have to say, it must have been something extremely terrifying like absolute panic terror for them to leave the way they did without the appropriate clothes. I mean, one of the girls was found with just, um, I think it was a sweater or something wrapped around her feet. There wasn't, yeah. She didn't even yeah. take time to put her boots on. They were yeah. in their long underwear. They took off. I mean, what would cause no. that to happen? Yeah, they were in socks in, as you say, minus 30, and it was minus six here the other morning and it was absolutely freezing so you imagine three times four times that that cold no Uh, and you you, i'm sure you can yeah but you you wouldn't survive any length of time you know with a couple of socks on your feet running in so they weren't even you know i mean just walking in snow or whatever you'd barely last an hour or two no no more than that now the made their way down the pass they, to, towards a tree line. Now, they did make the tree line, and they started a small fire. Now, from what I understand, one of them tried to climb a tree because there was broken branches in this Christmas tree. I don't know if they were hiding, if they were looking for more fuel for the fire. Can you bring us to that small little campfire and what transpired there in your own perspective? It looks like they've got a fire, a small fire going but it was only a small fire. Going up into the tree seems odd as well because there was smaller... The branches were broken up to 15 metres. That's 45 feet up in the tree. It's been put forward that they were maybe escaping from something, which is a possibility. But some of them were so badly injured they couldn't move anyway. They got this small fire going, but the two that were found there, Krivonishenko and Doroshenko, had been literally put in their whole arm into the flames and their legs just to try and, and heat them up but obviously the they were dying of cold at that point but it shows how bad it must have been for them but they obviously couldn't get a big enough fire going but to be honest i think even if they got a huge roaring blaze going they'd have been fighting to stay alive oh yeah minus 30 folks uh, yeah. unless you've actually experienced it <coughs> it's unbelievable i mean you're you're Everything freezes within seconds. 
Uh, this is where you see, you know, your breath. Uh, if you're wearing, if you have a beard, the icicles start to form immediately. Your nose hairs freeze. Everything starts to freeze immediately. Human beings aren't designed without the proper attire to sustain themselves in weather like that. Now, I want to talk about the internal injuries that took place on some of the bodies. Can we talk about that? I know there was a tongue missing on one of the girls. There was eyes missing, smashed in skull. The most significant injuries were to Zolotarev and uh, Luda Dubonina. Their ribs were smashed in as if they'd been hit by a car, but with no external marks. Others had what looked like blows to the skull. Thibault Rignol, he was of French parentage. He'd been born in a, a prison camp. His father was sent to a gulag, and he was born there. But he had, um, he had damage to his skull. And, and so did Rustam. Um, Kolovatov had a, an injury behind, uh, quite a severe injury behind his ear. So they, they'd all received blow, what looked like blows or, you know, well, you know, the, the unknown compelling force, which in many ways doesn't really mean anything, but it does in the sense that it gives us an idea of some kind of massive force crushing ribs, um, you know, and causing the skull to fracture so you, you, you wonder what could have caused that uh, and luda the, the the one of the girls had her tongue missing and it wasn't just her tongue it was the whole uh the the the, uh, the whole base of the tongue was missing as well so but it doesn't say it was torn out the autopsy and it doesn't say it was cut out it just says the tongue and the root area were all missing which is one of the biggest mysteries of the whole thing um, and also her nose had been virtually smashed into her face. So, you know, as if she'd been punched. What do you think of this new fellow that was just found last year, 50 years old, the same darn spot? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was bizarre. Yeah, yeah weird. <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly yeah. in the exact same yeah. spot. And alone, yeah. I mean, who goes out there by themselves? And apparently there was no trauma or anything to the body and... Who knows what the uh, autopsy revealed? Well, it, you know, no, I'm just going to say he he'd actually survived one winter up there already, um, so he must have had he must have been reasonably hardy to have done that. But he, he didn't survive the second winter, assuming the cold killed him. But he was dead. <laughs> that's for sure. Unbelievable yeah. story, this mystery. Okay, what did the autopsy reports actually reveal, and where did they fall short, in your opinion? Well, I, I wonder partially if the autopsy reports have been deliberately doctored to give two different causes of death to make the, as if to cover something up. Either they all died of the cold, or they all died of injury you know injury yeah i mean there are trauma. the other thing was eyes were missing as well that was another thing um but uh you know it's difficult to say because everybody looks to the autopsies everybody looks to them because they think that's where the answer is which makes me wonder as if they've been doctored in some way i don't know it's a, you can't say but one significant thing is that um the head of the prosecutor's department, uh, Klinov, Nikolai Klinov, he went up to um, the uh, morgue where the autopsies were being performed in the um, prison camp up there just north of Ibdel. He was present at the autopsies. Now, why would the head of the prosecution department go 400 miles up to stay there for a couple of days whilst the autopsies are being performed on five people who look as if they've died of misadventure. Uh, because uh, Okishov, he mentions this in his interview uh, that, that's in my book. Um, he said it was an un very unusual for him to have to do that, or not to have to do it. He did it of his own accord. But he does obviously doesn't know whether he was told to do that, to make sure that the uh, autopsies, how should we say, were... Uh, prepared the right way, maybe. It's un it's odd, well, but there's, there's no real reason for him to have been there because on the face of it, these five people, uh, the first found had died of the cold and they died yeah. of misadventure, so why would you waste your time doing it? It's not as if it was just around the corner. 
from no, where he was exactly working. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Would there be a case to be made to have some of the bodies exhumed? And was there any anomalies in the way that the bodies were prepared or buried? I'm well, uh, they, they talk again. They, they talk about the strange orange color of the skin. And again, uh, Lev Ivanov and Okishov both mentioned that in their interviews. If you Well, Lev Ivanov actually wrote an article and he talks about the strange coloring of the skin. People have sort of said, oh, well, it's UV rays from the sun. But Lev Ivanov had been a a prosecutor for many years, and he'd come across plenty of deaths, bodies, cadavers out in the open and the court, and he'd never seen anything like that before. That's, uh, again, another oddity. Would you like to see a new investigation opened, and perhaps with an exhumation of the bodies? Maybe we can find out more? Well, they, they won't agree. Yeah, I, I think that would be very good to do, to exhume the bodies, but uh, the, they won't agree to it. The the um, the relatives won't agree, and I mean, I suppose you can understand that to a certain extent. Um, but I've said this before that uh, two of the bodies are uh, uh, buried in uh, a different cemetery. at Solitarev and uh, Krivonishenko. They were buried separately to the other uh, the other seven. Um, and Yuri Yudin's buried there now because he's dead as well. Uh, what they want to do is to exhume those two bodies and move them over to the other cemetery so if you like they would all be together where the memorial is but the families wouldn't agree to it and they can be overruled uh, if a good enough case is given to the city authorities but nobody's ever done it you know it's i think i think they'd have a bit of a fight to do it it would be a tough sell i think yeah. now yeah. i was going to ask you when the story first broke when did it did it break in 1959? Did were people aware? How did the press cover it? Was there a cover up going on? Do you think at that time? Well, uh, again, you've got to look at the way the Soviet Union was. Uh, you know, they didn't report aircraft craft and say this airliner crashes were not reported. So why would you, uh, you know, report the deaths of nine fine, upstanding young communists? Uh, with all, obviously there was something going on, because when they failed to come back at the appointed time, he, uh, Igor Dyatlov was supposed to send a telegram around the 12th of February, and they were due back in the city by the 14th or 15th. Uh, and it was the parents, you know, there was no telegram. Um, so the parents were starting to get worried. Uh, uh, Okishov talks about it in his interview. He says... Uh, he had the parents sitting in front of him calling him a fascist and saying, why the hell weren't they, you know, basically getting off their backsides and doing something. And, and he said he didn't know what to say to them because it looks like something was going on in the background. Uh, people were saying, you know, it's almost as if people were saying, well, put this on the back burner, you know, let it ride out a bit. And And again, you can read all sorts of things like that into it where they – preparing a scene or did they maybe want them never to be found you know it's it's just strange in, they seem to be trying to put it off as long as they possibly could and eventually um well well over a week to 10 days after they were supposed to have sent the first telegram they eventually sent search parties up to look for them but the whole delay is, is just odd because uh, as he as he said in his interview Okshov, uh, people the parents were crying in his office saying, please do something. And they were contacting the local Communist Party. Some of them had contacted the, the Central Party of the Soviet Union in Moscow to say, please help us to find you know, our children, basically. I know they were in their 20s, but these were the parents. So they were, you know, they were very worried. And, and the, the story, if you like, the, uh, all the students at the university, they were well known, uh, the, the, the members of the group. You know, there are plenty of friends there. The um, the university authorities uh, told them that they weren't to attend the funerals and they were to attend their lectures on the days of, on the day of the funeral. But a lot of them just ignored it. So there was a lot of ill will, if you like. Uh, but I think people could sense there was a cover up. It was the the authorities tried to keep it low key, but you know word gets around in a, even in a big city and people knew what was going on. There was a lot of people at the funerals all the students who'd been up helping the search. It was their friends that had died. They'll speak to other family members. They'll speak to friends. So the word got out very quickly. 
but they seem to be an attempt to try and play it all down. It definitely sounds like there was a cover-up going on, and uh, I have to tell you, folks, in 1963, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Soviet people were really unaware of what was going on, and we were that close to nuclear annihilation. Um, the American press, the Western press, of course, was all over it, but in the Soviet Union, man, that clamp came down, and that was it. So uh, you're quite right on that. There was, some, I think there was a cover-up going on. KGB involvement? perhaps, military well, intelligence? It, again, going back to Okishov, he he's certain that they were involved. He, he said with their resources, they they would have known. If you like, these were the official civil investigators, you know, the, the your average cops in the big city, but the KGB obviously were on a higher level to them, had more powers, and he says he's certain that they must have been involved. I mean, apart from anything else, um, you've got a couple of people, a couple of guys there who are involved with nuclear matter, you know, working in nuclear facilities. Of course they're going to get involved. They've denied any involvement, but they must have been involved. They, they were trying to build ballistic missiles. They were putting all their efforts into research on nuclear matters. And you have two guys who are quite well qualified. One of them had helped clean up after the nuclear accident down in Chelyabinsk. Um, yeah, and so he had a lot of knowledge. So the, the, the KGB have got to be involved. Yeah, I don't see how they could not be. Yeah, I mean, you could write a letter saying you didn't like the Soviet, you know, the the uh, the the what do you call them, the president or the general secretary of the Soviet Union, you could write a letter like that, and you, you, they'd probably devote enough resources to solve a, a major murder inquiry to find out who did. That actually happened with Andropov some, uh, in the 1980s. Some, uh, they, he was eventually tracked down to a, a university lecturer, I think it was, in Kiev or somewhere like that. He'd been writing letters to the paper saying this place is a dump, the, the people running it don't know what they're doing, and uh, they Apparently the KGB devoted more resources to it than they would have done to a major murder. And I'm so, not so certain no. things have changed between Khrushchev's time, 1959, no. and where we're at today with Mr. Putin. Yeah. Or in the United States, to be honest, with the cover-up yeah. of the Kennedy assassination and other things yeah. that are going on, like Benghazi, from yeah. what I've looked at. The book is called Mountain of the Dead, the Dyatovlov Pass Incident, and the other book is called Journey to Dyatovlov Pass, an Explanation of the Mystery. There's the music. Keith McCloskey's been our guest tonight. Thank you so much, my friend, for being a super trooper. Triple Thank w you very w much, friend. www.nightfrightshow.com. Stay warm, everybody. See you next time. Thanks, friend. Inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza. First person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com.